Hey, welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and this is 5 Cases in 5 Minutes Head and Neck Imaging Number 2. I'm going to show each unknown case slide for about 10 seconds, and you can pause and study the images further. I'll then review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and we'll move to the next case. Ready? Let's go. Case 1, History of Fever, CT Neck. All right, so we've got axial and sagittal contrast enhanced CT scans of the neck at the level of the oral pharynx here. And we have a large rim enhancing fluid collection centrally hypodense in the region of the left tonsillar pillar, the left palatine tonsil. And there it is on the sagittal view with that rim enhancement and central hypodensity. And this is typical for a peritonsillar abscess. So this is a complication of tonsillitis with abscess formation in the peritonsillar space. And it's actually usually located superior to the tonsil between the tonsillar capsule and the superior fringe of constrictor muscle. And you want to look for associated complications like mass effect against the airway, extension into other spaces where you could get a retropharyngeal abscess, which we do not have here. And then you can also get complications of septic thrombophlebitis where you can get infected clot within the internal jugular vein. That's known as Lemierre syndrome. Now, don't confuse that with the talking candle Lumiere from which movie? Yes, Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> now, this is typically caused by the same pathogens that will cause tonsillitis, so strep staph and haemophilus. And this is also a good example of the parapharyngeal space. On the right here, this normal triangle of fat. On the left, you can see it's effaced by this abscess within the pharyngeal mucosal space, displacing it laterally. So this is a good triangle of fat to look for as part of your search pattern when you're looking at a CT neck or even a CT cervical spine, as if you have a mass or other abnormality in the masticator space, the carotid space, the retropharyngeal space, or the pharyngeal mucosal space, those will all efface the fat pad in different patterns. Okay, case 2, T1, and T1 post-contrast MR images. Okay, so here's the cerebellum and there's the pond. So we're at the level of the cerebellopontine angle cistern and there's the fourth ventricle. So here's the normal internal auditory canal on the left with the cochlea there and there's the basilar artery flow void anterior to the pons. But on the right here, you can see expansion of that right internal auditory canal and there's a mass extending out of it into the cerebellopontine angle cistern with mass effect against the pons and cerebellum. And you can see on post-contrast images here, it avidly enhances with some heterogeneity. So this is typical for a vestibular schwannoma. So this is also known as an acoustic neuroma, and it's a benign tumor of Schwann cells. It arises from the vestibulocochlear nerve, which lives here in the internal auditory canal. And it represents about 80% of the CP angle masses. So the, these patients usually present with sensory neural hearing loss. They might also have tinnitus and headache. So the typical imaging appearance is like this one. It looks kind of like ice cream on a cone. You can also think of it as the internal auditory canal here is blowing a bubble because it tends to form an acute angle here like this with the adjacent dura. And it typically will widen the porous acousticus, which is the medial portion of the internal auditory canal right here. So when these get larger, they can actually show cystic degeneration. And what syndrome would you think about if you saw multiple bilateral schwannomas? Yes, neurofibromatosis type 2. You can think of that as the miss me syndrome, the multiple inherited schwannomas, meningiomas, and ependymomas. All right, case two, axial T2 and flare images. Slide two of two, post-contrast axial and coronal images. Okay, so we've got T2 axial and flare axial images again of the cerebellopontine angle cistern region. And then there's the fourth ventricle, which has T2 bright CSF within it. You can see there's also CSF tracking into the internal auditory canals bilaterally, which is normal, but slightly superior to that region in the CP angle, abutting the petrous temporal bone here. You can see that there's an extra axial mass. And what do you think about the signal intensity of this mass? Well, it looks like it's iso intense to gray matter, which is cortex of the brain. And there's also a sense that there's some dural thickening here inferiorly. So when we give contrast, you can see that this mass is diffusely enhancing, very homogeneous. And it's slightly extending into the internal auditory canal, but it's not centered within it. Here's the normal right internal auditory canal. So this is typical for a cerebellopontine angle meningioma. So meningiomas are actually the most common extraaxial tumor in adults, but only about 10% occur in the posterior fossa here. Usually they occur along the falcs, along the parasagittal region, and along the sphenoid wing. But they'll have a similar imaging appearance. So they're extra axial, meaning they're outside of the brain parenchyma. And they classically will have this tail of dural thickening, which you can see is enhancing here. And also notice that this slightly extends into the left internal auditory canal here, but it's not centered within it like the vestibular schwannoma was, right? And it's also not expanding the porous acousticus. Moreover, instead of forming an acute angle with the adjacent petrus, the adjacent dura, you can see that there's more of an obtuse angle here. 
also on this side. And just like with schwannomas, if these are multiple, you would again think about neurofibromatosis type 2. Also, occasionally, not so much in this case, you can get hyperostosis or erosion of the underlying bone with meningiomas. Okay, case 4, slide 1 of 2, CT scan of the orbits. Slide 2 of 2, coronal images of the orbits. This is a little harder to characterize on the axial images, but here you see that there's marked thickening of the muscle belly of the superior rectus muscles bilaterally, and also of the inferior rectus muscles even more so. We also have some thickening of the medial rectus muscles bilaterally, but not so much of the lateral rectus muscle. And there's a little bit of stranding here in the infracornal fat behind the globe here. And what else do you notice about the globes? Well, if we look at the line here along the zygomatic arches here, the globes are displaced anteriorly, so this is exophthalmos. And one final point, notice that the tendinous insertions here of the rectus muscles are not involved. They seem to have a normal thickness, and this abnormality seems to be isolated to the muscle bellies. And this is much easier to see on the coronal images. You see this marked thickening of the extraocular muscles here and some fat stranding within the orbital fat. And this is typical for thyroid-associated orbitopathy. So this is also known as Graves' ophthalmopathy. And it's actually the most common cause of proptosis in adults, and it's typically associated with Graves' disease. So on imaging here, you'll typically get this appearance where you get this bilateral symmetric enlargement of the extraocular muscle bellies with sparing of the tendinous insertion. And there's a typical pattern of involvement with a handy mnemonic, I'm slow. So the inferior rectus is usually involved first, then the medial rectus muscles, and then the superior rectus, then the lateral rectus to a lesser extent, and then finally the obliques. So that helps you if you ever see isolated thickening of the lateral rectus muscle with normal inferior medial and superior rectus muscles, it's probably not thyroid-associated orbitopathy. And maybe one of the other differential considerations for this abnormality, such as orbital pseudotumor, and that pathology will typically also involve the tendinous insertion of the extraocular muscle. And when this is acute, you will also get some inflammatory fat stranding within the intracoronal fat. So this can be self-limiting, but it may be treated with steroids. And when severe, it might actually require surgical decompression. All right, last case, temporal bone CT. Okay, so we have three axial images of the temporal bone through the level of the ossicles, and this is a patient that had a history of trauma. And you can see that there's actually a fracture line here extending longitudinally through the temporal bone. So this is a longitudinal temporal bone fracture. So clinically, these patients might present with periauricular swelling or retroauricular ecchymosis, which is known as that battle sign behind the ear. So it's called a longitudinal fracture when it's parallel to the long axis of the temporal bone, and this is actually the most common. And if it's a perpendicular fracture, that's known as a transverse fracture. In reality, though, a lot of the fractures are oblique or mixed. And there's certain things you want to look for when you see this type of fracture. So just to review a little anatomy here, you can see that this ice cream on a cone here is the malleus on the incus. I know that's a second ice cream cone mentioned in this lecture, but it is summer. So these type of fractures can cause ossicular disruption or dislocation. So you want to make sure this malleo articulation is intact. And then so the bottom of that ice cream cone is known as the short process of the incus. But then you can see this part extending medially is the long process, which will continue as this posterior line here as the lenticular process. And then that will articulate with the stapes, which is right here. So this is the incutostapedial articulation, and that can also be disrupted. This anterior line here is part of the malleus as well. That's known as the manubrium. So basically, you want to see if there's any disruption of the ossicles, and if there is, that can be a cause of conductive hearing loss with these longitudinal fractures. Transverse fractures can cut across the vestibulocochlear nerve, and that can cause sensory neural hearing loss. And then a few other structures you want to look at. So the facial nerve canal is here. This is the horizontal or tympanic segment. You want to look for any facial nerve disruption in the setting of a temporal bone fracture. And then also the carotid canal is right here. That's definitely an issue if there's a fracture extending into that region. And then also, this is the otic capsule, this dense bone overlying the cochlea here. Remember we talked about that as a location for a glomus tympanicum in the last lecture? That's also important to describe whether the fracture is involving that capsule or not. All right, let's do a rapid review of those cases. So case one, the peritonsillar abscess. Here we are in the pharyngeal mucosal space at the level of the oral pharynx. It's a complication of tonsillitis with abscess formation in the peritonsillar space. And look for complications, including extension into other spaces like forming a retropharyngeal abscess, thrombophlebitis of the adjacent veins like the internal jugular vein, and then also airway compromise. And look for that displacement of the fat-containing peripharyngeal space to clue you in that there's a nearby abnormality. Cases two and three, the vestibular schwannoma and the meningioma at the CP angle. 
The schwannomas tend to be centered in the IAC, whereas meningiomas are centered away from the IAC. Schwannomas will expand the porous acousticus, which is the medial aspect of the internal auditory canal, whereas meningiomas, even if they extend into the IAC, will not typically expand it. Schwannomas tend to form an acute angle with the dura overlying the petrous temporal bone, whereas meningiomas form more of an obtuse angle, as you see here. Schwannomas typically don't have any dural tail, although if you're observant, there's a tiny dural tail in this case. That's a little atypical, but meningiomas will more commonly have that dural tail, that thickened enhancement along the dura. Schwannomas will not have any bony reaction, but meningiomas may have bony reaction like hyperostosis or erosion. All right, case four, the thyroid-associated orbitopathy, typically associated with graves, causes proptosis, which is bulging of the eyes anteriorly. And remember the mnemonic, I'm slow, for the progression of extraocular muscle involvement, starting with the inferior rectus. Finally, case five, longitudinal temporal bone fractures are the most common. Look for ossicular disruption as a cause of conductive hearing loss and also involvement of the facial nerve, carotid canal, or otic capsule. Hey, that's it for five cases in five minutes. Head and neck imaging number two. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture. And if so, please subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. It would be magnificent if you shared these lectures or left a podcast review. Many thanks to those of you that have. You can also comment on YouTube and visit radiologisthq.com for more info or to get video link updates through social media. Thanks and have a great day.